Yeah, hello there. So for this video, we're going to discuss Velma output results. And as we can see here on the screen, these results, uh, there's a lot of different results that get put into your results folder. So from the prior video, we initialized the Velma run and had it running successfully. For Watershed 1, it ran from 1980 through 1989. So that's what these results are here. So you should have something similar to this. Uh, the actual name depends on what you named your simulation. For mine, I just tagged on an underbar and the date when I ran this. And Velma, by default, outputs pretty much everything here with the exception of the cell data writers. Everything else will come with any Velma simulation that is ran and so let me sort by type here and you'll see there's a series of uh, ascii formatted maps that have to do mostly with hydrology a little bit with reach maps uh, the reach maps under a basic velma run are going to be uniform but under velma parallel you're able to run a variety of sub reaches and so then those maps will be more meaningful there are also some uh, global state down here, uh, global state log reports everything that happens per action. Uh, there's a configuration report. Uh, a big one is the Nash Sutcliffe coefficient file, which is a great statistic for hydrology of um, comparing uh, simulated hydrology versus the observed. And for this simulation, did a pretty good job overall for 1981 through 1989 with a Nash Sutcliffe of 7.2, uh, 0 0.72. It's a scale uh, where one is perfect. And so that's a pretty good statistic. Anything over 0 0.6 for the Velma model, we're considering uh, there's a pretty good simulation where a lot of things are going well. Not everything, it's not perfect. Points, anything over 0.7 is pretty respectable. And you get in the 0.8 or even 0.9 range, then uh, really exceptional. And the other thing Velma automatically puts out is these PNGs, which is just an image of the GUI uh, while Velma's running it. They're output on the last day of every year, so December 31st of each year of the simulation. It's not always this view, it's just whatever view you're looking at at the time of the simulation. So you see here, the prior video I started showing soil saturation and when I did that it got left there uh, for a few years maybe the whole simulation the rest of it <clears throat> so it's just whatever view uh, you're at graph view or map view you're at at the December 31st these are pretty nice uh, especially for calibration calibrating the hydrology normally um, that's a view that's similar to this, but it's a separate view that provides a little bit different information. Uh, the upper graph is very similar, but there's some other information. That's a great one to put on if you just by default um, just want to capture something or just leave it on this view is also useful. <clears throat> the other thing Velma outputs I mentioned was the cell data writers and these have to be input and assigned by the user running the model. So Velma has two different views. One is a delineated average, meaning from a certain point, anything upstream that is part of the catchment to that point, or part of the subwatershed to that point, that is recorded in a lot of this information. Uh, like the last thing we're going to look at is daily results. Um, but Cell data writers are a little different. They are the information at a given cell. So they are not a delineated average, but rather the actual information occurring at a cell by cell basis. Um, and so you can see more of the interaction of a cell among its neighbors or things like its um, nitrogen load or carbon load. Um, so it's the, it's the actual um, you know, everything that Velma tracks per cell uh, occurring at that cell versus a daily results file is uh, the uh, always a delineated average of the whole watershed to that pore point location or that catchment location. <clears throat> so I've sort of pre-prepped ahead of time to make this keep this video a little bit shorter. 
a very typical routine for Velma. And that would be to launch this daily results file, most likely in Excel, and then also go to the uh, observed data. There it is. And here's the file that I grabbed for this example as a comparison. So I wanted to look at the 1980 to 1989 uh, observed data versus Velma's simulated data. And so that is what these are here. Uh, the daily results file, when you open it, looks like this. Let me uh, wrap these. <clears throat> There's a lot going on in here. Um, you get your uh, your uh, climate parameters up front, and then you get this runoff all, which would be very similar to something like CFS, cubic feet per second, though Velma functions in uh, millimeters per day, which if you know the delineated area of your simulation, then you can convert between the two. Uh, you also get information per layer, because Velma has four soil matrix layers and a surface layer. So you get information for the four soil layers, the surface layer, um, soil moisture, um, which is that map that we were looking at. So, but again, you always got to keep the context that these are delineated averages over the system versus when we were watching soil moisture, then we were looking at the cell by cell soil moisture levels per layer. Uh, ET parameters come next, temperature values, and then we start to get into the carbon and nitrogen for the humus pools, biomass pools, both above ground, below ground, root system, stem, uh, AG. When you look at these, um, AG is above ground, BG is below ground. So above ground stem would be like branches, below ground stem would be root system. Let's see what else might be. Um, the NH4 pools, DOC, uh, net primary production, the MPP. So there's a lot of information here. And if you compare these to cell data writers that are part of your simulation, you can start to tease apart where a lot of these are similar, but again, can't overly stress how much the fact that daily results are delineated averages to a location, to a poor point or to a catchment versus cell data writers are only what is occurring at that location. So a, a big example right out the gate is you cannot get runoff from a cell data writer because that again, it's just for a singular location, but a single location is not a catchment. Um, but you can assign a catchment and then receive all of the incoming upstream information, which is what we're looking at here. So a typical routine for Velma is to acquire the dates, the runoff all, and then go get the observed data in millimeters per day and compare them. So that's what I did here. These are just, let me see here, these and this came from these data. And then I also got the observed data from my observed file, put this in here. And then we always throw away at least the first year, that's the spin up year where the soil matrix, what happens is um, field capacity is set to the max level across the whole watershed. And so it takes at least a year for that to uh, drain out. So you gotta go through a summer season, back into a winter season and do a second year at least. Sometimes we even go two, three years uh, if we can afford it. <clears throat> and what that allows then is the system to, for the hydrology to sort of um, balance out and equilibrate to where it should be. And then from there, then the climate drivers and the soil matrix and ET that all then um, drives the system like it would uh, in reality or close to it. Uh, so we always throw away the first year. So here I threw away 1980. Uh, this is then, I added this date just for Excel, makes it much easier for graphing purposes. And then I just graphed date versus simulated runoff all versus observed runoff all. And that's what we are looking at here. Uh, and so when you look at the Nash Sutcliffe statistics, then you get an idea, good idea of how simulation ran overall, but when actually graphing it year by year or multiple years here, you can then start to see where the model performed really well versus didn't perform so well, missing some really big peaks. 
So probably a minor amount of calibration work could correct this. Um, but overall, working pretty well. Uh, another thing that Velma is really great at is low flows. And so if you take these data, let's make this a little bigger. Uh, if you take your y-axis and then switch it to a log scale, then you can, um, it sort of de-emphasizes the peak events and under log scale, you can then really start to tease apart the low flow effect. So first couple of years, you know, this is kind of a sign maybe we should throw away more than just one year here. We should let the model work itself out for more than a few years because then we kind of reach in 83, 84, reach this point where we're hitting the summer low flows pretty well. Uh, not true in every single year, of course, um, but this is looking pretty good versus these seem to be an anomaly early on. Um, and so there's a couple different ways. Uh, again, this, you can focus in on the summer low flow versus then set this back to the normal scale where then you can start to focus in on the peak storm events in the winter, depending on the, the goal of running the model. So, um, <clears throat> and, you know, getting in that level of detail, often we're doing when we're worried about not worried about, but we're trying to improve a calibration. It really highlights aspects of the model that might need to be a little bit of adjustment, or maybe we need to have some better um, data to focus in on. And let's see, there was one other, oh yes, the other thing to look at uh, that you should go to pretty quickly is uh, the annual result file. So when you start to look at those and you see those differences, you know, a couple of years did really well, but a couple of years didn't do so well. If you go look at the annual results file, hopefully I don't have one open. I do not, good. Excel never likes to open stuff with the same name. <clears throat> Here, this is the annual hydrology results to the same poor point as the daily results file, but these are the results summarized per year. And so looking through these, uh, looking pretty good. Overall, these are, again, throwing away the first year. Every year after is at least a 0.6. You know, 88 was right at 0.6. But the several years in the 0.7, we even have a year that's a 0.83. And so when you start to then uh, dive a little deeper into the analysis of your results, then looking at stuff like this in Velma can really help uh, highlight how certain years are doing well versus other years. The other thing, it's not all about soil matrix and flow. Um, another reason we look at the annual results is to look at the what's going on with the AET versus PET, which is the actual evapotranspiration versus the potential. And this looks pretty good overall for the Northwest, column L here, uh, paper that suggests that these should be in the 0.2 to 0.3 range. A lot of the years are in the 0.3, but for a four system like this, not liking these uh, 0.5s so much. So a uh, little adjustment could be going on with the calibration of evapotranspiration. Uh, though, I will say that this simulation has a uniform forest, uniform age, which is not true. So we might be just over-representing because of our uh, age structure that isn't fully representative or, you know, it's a, with some other data, we could probably improve the age of the forest system, which uh, could dial these in a little better. It'd probably be the first thing to do. So yeah, just a little summary of some of the Velma results. And uh, hopefully it is helpful for whatever you're attempting to do with the Velma model. Thanks.